Okay, thanks everyone for coming and welcome to One Million Cups. As you know, uh, One Million Cups is a weekly educational program that started right here in Kansas City at the Kauffman Foundation, um, where we bring together two local businesses to hear um, not just their pitch, but their entrepreneurial story, uh, how they got started, how they made the choice to quit their day job, and all the other things that we're all curious about when we think about uh, starting our own businesses, um, or you know, things that you're going through right now. Um, and then we also get together, we ask questions, we offer resources, we open our little black books, and we help uh, create successful businesses right here in Kansas City uh, using our relationships and, and our community resources. Um, so, as you all can see on your seats, please take a look at the announcement sheet. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, and we want to thank MediaHead, who is our announcement sponsor, for putting this together for us and generously printing them for free. Um, you can get information about the week's presenters. You can take notes about the questions, the many, many questions that you will ask. Yeah. Um, and then you can also see a list of all the great events that are going on in Kansas City this week. There are many. Um, so, if you want to include something in the announcements going forward, like we have said in the past, we are trying to get away from the in-person announcements, so send us an email before 2 p.m. on Monday, and we will include your announcement in this printed version. If you have something special, let us know and we'll work with you. Um, there are always a couple of special things, but for the kind of who, what, when, where, why, how announcements, we're going to start printing them and we're going to stop making in-person announcements. Um, so, uh, another quick announcement on behalf of the entire One Million Cups team. It's a very special day. Um, it's the day that we launch our 32nd city um, and our second Columbia. So Columbia, South Carolina is launching today and we have launched uh, Columbia, Missouri in the past. So even if... Can I say rock chalk? Is that allowed? Rock chalk. Anyway. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce our first couple of presenters, uh, John and Matt from Zoom in Market. Uh, it's a new grocery store concept in Olathe. Um, and if you're a Johnson County entrepreneur, find me after uh, the show, <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk more about how to get involved. But John and Matt, I met in Olathe at a great event, um, and they're going to tell you about their concept. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Melissa. And thank all of you for coming this morning and sharing your time with us. We appreciate that, and thank you, One Million Cups. Um, they told us that we have about six minutes this morning to, to give you just a little general overview of who we are and what we are. So I stayed up till about three this morning. I got it down to an hour and 15, so settle in. Uh, just kidding. We'll try and roll through it, give you a broad overview, and maybe hit some of our passion points in the question and answers afterwards. Um, as she said, this is John Yerkes. I'm Matt Ryder. We've got about uh, 26 other folks, and together we make Zoom and Market. Um, Everybody who's been in any industry for any amount of time, it, you realize that it doesn't take long to figure out what people dislike about your industry. What drives them nuts, what, what makes them crazy, what they actually hate. Well, John spent 20 years in the grocery industry, and as you can imagine, he has a really good story or two about the things that people come up and say they hate about grocery. I think most of us will probably recognize some of these as we tell you some of the problems that we're trying to solve. Number one, the weather's never nice, is it, when you have to go to the grocery store? It's raining, it's snowing, it's ice cold, it's super hot. You have no desire to traipse through a parking lot where you can never find a parking space. All right, once you get in, you're going to get to a basket. Some kid's got his candy all over the handle. You forgot to wipe it off. The wheel's squeaky and wobbling, and you get out to your car still going like this. Um, or you made a list on Tuesday. On Friday, you have absolutely no clue where the list is. Or your wife made the list, you get there, realize you forgot to ask her what she meant, have no clue what she's looking for, and left your phone at home. Now you know you're going home not succeeding. Um, or how many of you can relate to this? Everybody in Johnson County shops at the exact same time that I do. Every single time. It's all, yeah, there's a few that are being honest. It's always crowded then. I have to take the little one who has no problem letting you know he'd be absolutely, rather be anywhere other than with me at the grocery store. Um, or the kids want to fight about all the snacks, or you have absolutely no clue in the big store where what you're looking for is. There's always somebody who's had a bad day and wants to share it with you, isn't there? Or when you finally make it to the checkout register, not only is everybody checking out at the same time, there's never enough cashiers to get you through. When you finally get up there, the person in front of you is writing a check, and it never dawned on them to start before their entire transaction is finished, right? Um, 
And then last but not least, you get there, it's your turn, and the cashier wants to tell you her entire miserable life story. And all you want to do is get out and go home. Anybody relate to any of those? Maybe. It all started because when you looked in your fridge at home, you were empty and you knew you needed food. There has to be a better way to do this. All right, Zoom and Market. That's why we're here, looking for that better way. Again, the process, you have to drive to the store, trudge through, trudge in, walk through, pick all these items, put them down in your bag, go up to the checkout register, take them all out of your cart, put them on the conveyor belt, they go through, you're either bagging them yourself, somebody's bagging them, you're putting them back in your cart, you're carrying them out to your car, trying to get your trunk open, um, put them in your car, and finally get a chance to leave. We want to change how that works. How about three steps? Click, live, and go. Just click. Okay, you're going to do your shopping at Zoom and Market online, just like you would at Amazon or anywhere else you shop online. You can do it on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer. You can do some of your shopping this morning, some of it tomorrow, some of it the day after, while you're sitting at soccer practice, watching TV, at work in a meeting you're really not interested in. If your boss is here, I didn't say that. Um, whatever you want, you go do your shopping. When you shop with us, you can shop in a lot of different ways. You can shop just searching for single items that you're interested in. You can create a list and say, I want milk, bread, and soda. Go, and it'll pop up all the milk, and then you pick the milk you want, and then it'll go to bread, give you a choice, you pick the bread you want, soda, so forth. You can also keep lists. You can keep lists of the things you buy every week if you want to. You can keep lists that are just individual recipes. And okay, this week I want to eat this, this, and this, so I'm going to throw those in there. Boom, we've got the ingredients. What did I buy last week? What do I buy the most? Lots of ways to make your shopping quick, convenient, and easy and make sure that you don't have to worry about the list that you made last week. Once you do your shopping, do you know what you do next? You live. That's right. You just got time in your life to go do whatever you want to do while we do the shopping for you. Our grocery store is a little different. Instead of coming in, customers don't come in. There's a customer service area in the front, but in the back, it's just us. It's just Zoomers doing the shopping for you. So all of our employees, work on a Samsung Galaxy tablet, when you place your order, it's going to ask you to pick when you want to pick it up. ASAP, tonight at 5.30 on your way home from work, Saturday morning at 9, you tell us when you want to pick it up. You're going to pay for it online, so you don't have to worry about that when you get to the store. Everything is done. Okay? When you hit go on that order, it's going to come through on the tablet, and Scott's going to have his tablet, and he's going to look at it, and he's going to start picking your groceries for you. Make sure he's got everything right. We're going to store them in the proper temperature zone. So your Bluebell ice cream is just exactly as cold as it should be when you come to get it, okay? Everything's going to be stored like that. When Scott's done picking your order, he's going to say, I'm done, and it's going to send you a message that says, your order's ready, okay? Then when your time comes, you come to our store, one of our guys is going to get a note that you're here. Greg's going to grab it. He's going to grab all of your groceries. He's going to roll out to meet you. We call the guys who bring your groceries out to you grinners because we hired a lot of smiley faces at Zoomin. He's going to come out, smile, tell you how good your hair looks today, put the groceries in the back of the car for you, and you're going to zoom on. And that's it. That's the general process. This is a picture. This is at our store. These are our little touchscreen kiosks, like a bank ATM. That's where you're going to pull up and put in your order number, and that's what's going to send the note in to Scott or to Greg to tell him that you're here to pick up your groceries. It's also going to tell you to pull around the corner under, we've got a 140-foot canopy there. It'll tell you which lane to pull into. So you'll pull in, you'll be out of the sun or out of the snow, out of the rain, comfy in your car, never have to get out of your car, sit there and wait while he rolls your groceries out, which are also going to be covered so they never get rained on or snowed on either, and he's going to bring them up to your car for you. What we're trying to do is give you back time in your life. We're taking away all of those inconveniences that we talked about in the beginning and give you something that is one of the hardest things to find in life, extra time. Be that an hour that you now, instead of shopping, you're at home trying a new recipe and making a family dinner so you guys can sit down and have a family dinner. You're spending time with what matters to you, whatever it is. That's, what, that's our general concept of what we're trying to do. Um, what can you do at this point, to help us, well, you can sign up for our newsletter at zoomandmarket.com. You can like us on Facebook. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. Um, you can also tell people about us. We really, really appreciate that. Or here in about a week and a half, you can give us a try if you're in the mood. Um, I know you have our email addresses. They're up here, too. 
We'd love to hear from you if you have questions you don't think of today, you don't get a chance to, but at this point my timer is on zero, so I'm going to turn it over to John to answer your questions. All right, so if you guys just raise your hands, um, Brian and Jason and I will try and get around to it. We'll start in the middle there, Jason. Yeah, um, do you have an idea or a sense of how many, what percentage of revenue is driven by impulse purchase, purchases in brick and mortar? And then B, that piggybacks on that, how are you driving those impulse purchases uh, in a proven manner? Absolutely. Um, a lot of this is a big experiment. I mean, but those impulse buys that you see at the check stand and whatnot, the candy bars, the batteries, what those sorts of things you're going to be able to find at our store. The way we look to address that as we build this site out is we're gonna know our customers better than anybody. <clears throat> Since you'll have an account, kind of like on Amazon, we know that you buy Oreos usually, and then all of a sudden uh, you didn't get them this time. Hey, do you wanna get your Oreos? Or uh, you buy hot dogs and, uh, you know, we'll make it a little easier for you and provide a suggestion. Maybe you need buns, chips, this sort of thing. Um, so, you know, the percentage of sales that is an impulse buy, from my experience in the industry, is a pretty small percentage of what a typical order is, from a pack of gum to a candy bar being a dollar or whatever. It's a nice add-on while they wait, while you wait in line for that cashier to get to you. But, and did I answer your question? Yep. We've got a question here in the center. Yeah, you guys seem to have it all together. You, uh, <laughs> We're good actors. It's a very good presentation. Uh, I, I like the advertising uh, presentation stuff. Tell us a little bit about your legacy. What, what have you done before and how'd you get here? Absolutely. Um, it's kind of a funny story, but we both came out of entrepreneurial endeavors. Uh, myself with a family grocery chain uh, here in Kansas City. And Matt uh, was in Dallas with uh, kind of a logistics background. His own business was cell phone repair shops. And uh, ironically, we were both at a uh, career counselor thinking that we wanted to get real jobs. And uh, I just told my wife that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this wonderful lady kind of saw that we were very similar and yet uh, complimentary based upon some of the uh, conversations that I had had with her about what I wanted to do, potentially with an idea like this. And uh, so we sat down at a Panera one day and the rest is history, but um, it took a lot of convincing ourselves. This has been going for about two years now, a lot of research, building something from the ground up is never easy. Uh, we've partnered up with some great people such as Brockton Creative to help build our software, uh, Kara Miller at Box Spring Design to do uh, our logo, our naming, and uh, yeah, we're just thrilled with how it's all come together. And we're, we're right at the cusp of it. Tomorrow we have a, a ribbon cutting out at our store, so. We have another question here right in the middle. John, I know that uh, maybe a lot of people don't realize that in the grocery industry, the margins are very, very tight, one, two percent. So can you address the uh, concept of you're in South Johnson County where people are probably willing to pay a little more? Could you talk about your pricing? And is it a concept that could go to other areas. Could you run this concept in an inner city or is it just totally financially unfeasible? Uh, no, I think it's totally feasible. As a matter of fact, um, my experience is with urban stores. Um, and at one point in the conversation, uh, we're starting with this one, we're not getting the cart before the horse, but uh, as far as the urban areas addressing uh, food deserts, I think it's a phenomenal concept because it costs so much less to put a typical store together. Uh, where you don't have the interior and you don't have the cashiers and you don't have the liability. So the potential for it to be used is only limited in our urban areas by you know, internet access. Um, but phones are getting everywhere, so uh, we should be good there. As far as uh, growing this concept, absolutely. We want to test this. We think it's going to change the way people shop. And I think uh, from the models that we've seen overseas, has the potential to really grow fast. Uh, so, Matt? You said something about margins, and, and that leads yep. to, to pricing and that sort of thing. And, and what you'll find is that our pricing is either comparable to what you're used to paying or below. It costs us less to run 
uh, the store the way we're doing it than it does a traditional store. And so there's no surcharge. There's no extra fee at the end. There's no markup on each additional item like there is for you know delivery and different things like that. And so you won't pay for the convenience. We even have some signs up with cows in our parking lot about no tipping because uh, we don't want you to tip on our Zoomers when they come out. Um, you, you, make, you make a valid point with margins in the grocery industry, but when you say 2%, I mean, it could be a negative percent. I mean, that is your net operating margin. Some stores don't make any money. Typical stores are going to run, uh, you know, produce at 40, 45%, you know, margins before expenses on produce, meat. Uh, your center of the store is going to be in your 20s typically. So we really feel like we can be more than competitive operating at about 40% less fixed costs every day. Oh, question on your right here, guys. I love this idea, but I'm, I'm wondering, you, with your produce and your meats, are you using local farmers, or, and do you have organic available as well? Yeah, great question. It's usually the first question people ask, you know. I can't pick out my produce. Um, so what we have done is we've partnered with some uh, local uh, suppliers and um, we are going to have them be our professionals, except, uh, essentially. So they will uh, do daily deliveries, they will give us fresh produce, and we're gonna guarantee every bit of that as it goes out to the consumer. As we bring it out to your drive-through stall, we're gonna, we're gonna show you our produce uh, as a part of the checkout process, make sure you're happy with it if you're ever not, because we don't want a bad apple to go out. We want people to be happy with the experience, not being able to pick it themselves. Um, as far as organic and local, as that becomes available and as we get our feet underneath us uh, setting this up, we absolutely plan on, on, uh, on bringing those offerings. But there's even, real quickly, there's even more than that, just past the produce and the meat. One of the things we're doing, you will find the national brands that you would normally find at a grocery store at Zoom and Market. We, are, we have made a concerted effort to reach out to local vendors. We have over 25 local vendors already and are still talking to more that will offer a number of different products outside of local produce and local meat. Um, some that actually we're going to be the only grocery store that even carries. Uh, you'll be able to go on our website and check it out and we'll show you the exclusive. We've got some partnerships uh, with some companies that have not been interested in going into other grocery stores but are in love with our concept. So we are very committed to local uh, vendors. Actually, um, one of our five core values is community and that is outside reaching out and, and involving those. So thank you for that question. We got a question right here in the front row. Good morning. Good morning. morning. So as I've gotten older, I have planet guilt. And I think about everything and how it affects the planet. Locavore, the question that was just asked, is very important to me. The cars pull up in front of your store. Idling cars drive me crazy. <laughs> and the size of your store, how does that compare the footprint to a regular store? Are you 25% the size, 50 Give us an idea. Absolutely. I think I would say, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, we're about a third of the size of what a typical store would be. A typical one in Johnson County is going to be about 50, all the way up to a high V on Antioch that's, I think is 100,000 square feet. We're 15. And because that we have a smaller footprint and that we don't have to have full looking shelves back there and everything, we can carry a wider variety. Um, as far as the idling cars, I get that. Um, that's part of the reason why we set up this whole uh, kiosk to drive through system. When somebody pulls up to that kiosk, they're letting us know inside right away that you're here, and then we can go get your product. So by the time you pull around to your stall, we're hopefully meeting you out there. And it's literally probably not much more than starting and stopping your engine in a parking lot a few times, you know. So not perfect there, but I do want to add to that as far as being a little bit uh, green. We, we're not able to do cloth bags at this point, but we are eliminating the plastic bag portion. So we'd be using uh, uh, recyclable uh, uh, paper bags uh, for all of our products, and then we'll be recycling all of our cardboard boxes and whatnot. Yeah. Question for you in the back here. Morning, guys. How are you doing? Great. I've got a question that concerns uh, just the now, as far as us and uh, food and uh, consumables. Um, how do you plan on solving the problem with logistics? Um, let's say that I live out in Blue Springs and I want to go shopping. I order online. What do I have to drive in order to go get my groceries? I know years ago 
uh, back in the early 90s uh, through Prodigy, uh, Schnucks uh, grocery store had a service where you could order online and they actually delivered the uh, groceries to your location or you had the opportunity to just go in, grab your basket and walk out. So how do you plan on uh, working a, uh, as far as locations, I mean, how far or how many locations do you have uh, so people can go get their groceries and B, I mean, are you going to come up with a model where you're actually doing the grocery delivery service? Because we live in a society where, I mean, we want it now. Right. And uh, I'm, if I order it online, I want it to be convenient for me rather than me going out to have to get it. Yeah, great questions. Um, the only thing we are short of on delivering you a store in Blue Springs and everywhere else is cash. So <laughs> come talk to us later and we'll put them all over. Um, you know, I think at the very beginning, when we looked at this, the models that we saw overseas were very strict about the delivery aspect. And if you look back to uh, companies, web van, um, you know, other such things, having people deliver your products with a company liability on a truck and then two, pro you know, two orders to somebody's house five miles away becomes logistically very, well, it becomes expensive and inefficient. No, I, I completely agree. Our, we're, we're not even touching the delivery is the bottom line. It's not part of our model. We've got a different model. We want the fresh groceries that you get when they're stored in the right temperature zone until 45 seconds before they're in the back of your car. Um, the, the cost structure and efficiency wise for delivery, we're not, we're not tr touching any of that. As far as locations, our first location opens, like he said, uh, in about a week and a half. We're in Olathe right off of I-35. Uh, we do have expansion plans, and so we are going to try and spread out through Kansas City, but at this point, that's, that's our only location. We have a question here in the middle. Do you accept coupons? Phenomenal question, Matt. You want to get it? <laughs> yeah. Great question. Okay. Um, not yet, but when we do, it's going to be easier than you've ever had it. And here's how that works, okay? Because everything is done online, including payment, um, we're not going to be able to have you bring clipped coupons in, okay? We'll have quite a few different sales and opportunities to still save money. What we are working on, if any of you have ever been to Costco, you know that if the manufacturer offers a coupon, they just automatically deduct it for you. That's what we'll be implementing so that if the coupon is out there, you're going to get that price without having to go through your Sunday paper and clip it. All the way in the back, guys. Hi. Uh, yeah, great idea. Are you guys going to make alcohol available through it, specifically Dark Horse Distillery, our next presenter? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we knew why you guys were really here today, so. <laughs> Pat's last name is Ryder, so he likes your vodka. But now, <laughs> Now, Kansas, we cannot sell uh, in our Olathe location. We cannot sell uh, anything but 3.2 beer. And as a matter of fact, we have decided not to even carry that at this point. Um, you know, logistically, with some of the ordering online and the permits and licensing, and the fact that not that many people buy 3.2 beer. Um, now, as we expand into Missouri and other places, I think it would be a nice tie-in to your meal choices if you're able to recommend wines or you know, uh, you know, how to make a drink and then be able to drop the uh, ingredients for that drink into your cart. So, you know, look out Missouri. We got a question here in the front to the right. My question really is around health food, like seafood and, uh, you know, low, low carbs and all that. Aside from dark chocolate and coffee, health food is my concern. Right. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, um, me too. I'm getting older and got to watch that stuff. But um, as we, uh, you know, right now, as we open, we're, we're kind of have a core uh, inventory of national brands, some local brands. Our hope is to be able to really expand that into, say you're on a gluten-free diet and you'll be able to adjust those settings on your account so you're only shopping gluten-free items. Uh, if you're diabetic, you know, what do you need to watch out for? It can then, on your account, it will be able to limit those things so that you're, you're buying those things. Uh, somebody suggested the uh, paleo diet. You know, if you're on the paleo diet and you want to be able to watch you know, those things, you can do that. We will be adding, uh, you know, significant items to that gluten-free, organic, local aspect, but 
we realized a long time ago, we couldn't be all things to all people. Um, you know, to be able to do this and to do it efficiently, uh, we weren't going to be able to carry everything. That's the whole idea. You know, go in a grocery store, you get 40,000 SKUs because you've got five different sizes and 27 brands of green beans, you know. Um, so we will, we will carry those national brands, but more on a Costco, um, not size-wise, but philosophy of carrying that one size and whatnot. Meat and fish, we'll have fresh meat. It will be vacuum sealed uh, uh, through some of our local suppliers like U.S. Foods who supply to restaurants and then other partnerships with National Beef. Seafood's a little trickier, probably just frozen. <laughs> yeah. We've got a question from the Twitter. Yep, a uh, question from the Twitter feed in two parts, one high tech, one low tech. Okay. So high tech is, will you have any kind of predictive analysis, kind of suggestions for things people might have forgotten or things people might enjoy uh, when they're shopping online? And then the low tech side is, you know, a grocery stores especially um, in the past have always been a gathering place for a community. So how are you going to kind of maintain that community aspect? Get that one, Matt. Sure. Uh, okay. On, on the high tech side, yes, we're still working on some of that. As we said, I think earlier, our, our entire system is homegrown uh, by a company here in Kansas City. And uh, so we're still working on some of the predictive ability for that. It is absolutely on the project uh, that we're working on and we're going to be continue to grow that just like John talked about with some of the other foods that you can do so that it'll help know what you want what to, and based on previous purchases things that it makes sense so yes we will have some of that and it'll continue to get better and better and better um, as you continue to shop and shop and shop right um, as far as the uh, what was the second part the low tech absolutely um, Community is something that matters to us. Like I said, it's one of our five core values, and we've got quite a few different ways that we're going to try and reach out and involve uh, our community, the local communities. One of the things that we're going to do, um, part of what our, our reward system will be, is an opportunity where you will earn credits that are dollars amount to that you will then be able to donate to local charities that we are partnering with, uh, like the Backsack program and Olathe that helps kids who don't have food on the weekends. They get to take it home with them, things like that. Uh, we're going to work with that. Uh, we've reached out and begun talking to some of the local uh, retirement communities where people uh, struggle to get in so that we can set up a program where we can get uh, food to them. Uh, we're looking at, we've got an extra little over an acre on our parking lot that we're not using, and you'll notice at our grand opening on April 27th, we're going to have a big event in that piece of the parking lot. We're looking at other events that'll go throughout the summer with a big movie screen and movies and things like that to bring the community together in that area. So where it won't be in the store, it'll be on site. All right, guys, we got one last question for you. Yeah, just real quickly, how did you go through your site selection process as a brand new enterprise? We don't get a lot of folks that do brick and mortar here. How did you pick this location in Olathe and how much larger do you see your catchment area being over the typical Hy-Vee in-house price chopper type operation? It was a dartboard. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead, John. <laughs> it was a painful process. Part of what we need to achieve with this model is a standalone building. And most empty grocery stores or large spaces are in a strip mall, right? Um, we drove by this space quite a bit. I live out in Olathe. I go to church right behind there. Um, I probably drove by it for a year before I really gave it any ser serious consideration. First of all, um, we love the community there. We get 70 to 100,000 brand impressions every day on I-35 off one of the busiest exits in Olathe. I used to get off of I-35 every day and head home. My only option there was Target to run in when my wife called up and said, can, we get, uh, can you stop and get something for dinner? And it's really just a right turn down and pop in, right turn out. If I'm saving 45 minutes waiting at Target, I'm gonna make a right turn and a right turn there. So there are, there are some restrictions to it, but ultimately we really love the ability to partner with the 4,000 people a week that go to church there. Um, you know, there's a, almost 200 commuters that park in that parking lot uh, for the bus transit system. And we're gonna have posters and market to those people. Do your shopping on the bus on the way home, come across the parking lot and, and pick them up. Uh, so, you know, a lot to like about that neighborhood. Um, I think in the future, uh, ideally, to be on a main thoroughfare, 119th, 135th, that sort of thing might make sense if we can build our own. And what was the second part of that? 
Did you see all the realtors taking notes? What's that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, great question. Yeah. Um, you know, typically, a grocery experience is about convenience. I mean, as long as they're price competitive and they're clean or whatever, it's what's on your way home a lot of times for that stock up or that chore shopping trip. But um, I think uh, I think that we have the potential to expand a little bit further until that we can put more impressions around town. Uh, because, like I said, if you're saving 45 minutes, there's a potential that people might drive another five or 10 minutes out of their way just to get that hassle out of their lives. We don't know yet. I mean, typically three to five mile radius is what you're looking at for a grocery store. And uh, it'll be interesting to see, but we'll have the analytics because everybody's gonna have an account and we'll see where they come from. All right, John and Matt, one last question. I think you have about 250 people here. Uh, what can we do as a community to support you during your launch? I know you touched on Twitter and Facebook, but is there anything more specifically that you want us to do? Um, I think part of what we've loved about this entire process for us is all of the people who have come along beside us and, and, and partnered with us just in over co coffee in the morning and sharing their experience and their ideas and things that they see and, and can help guide us on. And so we absolutely love that. We love those opportunities. So if you have an experience or an idea that you think relates to what we're doing, we'd love to hear about it. We really would. We'd love to talk to you in here. And so I think that's something in addition that you can do if you have something there. Awesome, let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. We've got, um, before we bring up the uh, distillery, um, if you have an empty seat next to you, will you raise your hand? We've got a lot of room up front, so come on up, grab a seat. We've got a couple quick live announcements. I'd like to bring, Doug Dressler from Sprint, up to the stage. Good morning, everybody. I am Doug with the Sprint Accelerator. Um, as you may or may not know, we are entering week three of our Sprint Mobile Health Accelerator down at the crossroads. We have brought 10 companies to Kansas City from all over the world. In fact, our Australian team, Olomobo, is in the house this morning. Guys, if you could stand up, let's give them a big one million cups. Kansas City, welcome. They told me they got lost in Westport this weekend, so that's great. Uh, the reason we're here is we have a big announcement that has a local impact. Five of our companies are looking to hire and fill 10 roles with local talent. So we are looking for UI, UX designers. We're looking for Android, iOS developers. We're looking for a firmware engineer, VoIP and SIP developer. We're looking for marketing and community managers, and we also have internships available. With these Kansas City companies now making this presence in our area. This is the great opportunity for someone to get in on the ground floor and work with amazing people down at the Sprint Accelerator. So visit SprintAccelerator.com slash jobs. The descriptions are there. You can apply there. Tweet it out and share it with your friends at Sprint Excel. And let's get these 10 roles filled with local talent. The Olo Mobile guys will be here afterwards to answer questions for what they're looking for. And you can talk to them about their company. And also just come down and visit us whenever you can in the crossroads. Thank you, guys. A uh, quick announcement. I don't know if you saw this in our announcement sheet in the center of the announcement she sheet. I have uh, Ilya here to talk about this. Uh, how are you doing? I'm Ilya Tabak, a uh, member of the Million Cups community for a while, and I wanted to talk to you about another member of our community that uh, had an unfortunate incident happen. He had a significant house fire. Uh, some of you uh, know, and many of you have heard of Landon Young with World Help Solutions. He came to Kansas City and Million Cups early last year and has really built a life and has helped build community in Kansas City. And so, unfortunately, on his journey, he's uh, had a bit of a speed bump. And so we're trying to kind of help support him. We have a Raise Mobile campaign, uh, and actually, recently, he went on a trip to Malawi um, for eight days, and the day he came back, he learned about this fire. So I'm gonna send out a tweet here in a second, directing you to a couple of different places, and in your program, there's a text message that can help. He's actually here today out in the lobby, so if you haven't met him, you should meet him anyway, because he's a great guy. But um, let's show him what the Kansas City and Million Cups community can do to help him out, and thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, let's get on to our next presentation. I'd like to introduce Damien Garcia from Dark Horse Distillery, a good friend of mine and 
maybe soon to be a good friend of yours. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Hey guys, I'm Damien with Dark Horse Distillery. We're out of, uh, we're a family owned and operated craft grain to bottle distillery located in uh, lovely Lenexa, Kansas. Uh, we actually founded our company, established it in uh, 2010. Uh, currently we have four spirits that are out in the market now. We've got our Dark Horse Distillery Reunion Rye Whiskey, which is made from a 100% rye whiskey mash. We've got our Dark Horse Distillery Reserve Bourbon Whiskey, which, was, which is a 80% corn, 20% rye mash. And those two products, those were the first two products that we actually, two spirits that we, we produced over at Dark Horse. We produced those in mid-2011, and we had to let those rest in uh, new American oak barrels to get the aging process started. The second two items that we have out in the market are Long Shot White Whiskey, which is a 51% corn, 49% mash bill that we use for that. Our Ryder Vodka, which is was released, uh, which was made in, uh, is, is another 100% wheat uh, vodka that we make as well. Those two products were released back in 2012. So those were the, are actually our first two items that we released. Um, we in turn also, just this past December, released a special release barrel strength reunion rye whiskey. That was a uh, limited number of bottles that we did of about 625. Um, we also, over at Dark Horse, do a, an event space as well. Um, it sits right next to our production, and it's in full view of everything that's going on within production. It's, it's blocked off by glass. Um, we launched that, our event space in January of 2012. We are a family owned and operate a business. Um, it's myself and I've got three other siblings that work at Dark Horse. Uh, my brother Patrick is our master distiller. Uh, my brother Eric is our G general manager. And my sister runs our event space. So we kind of came together to start Dark Horse from doing a lot of research on what to do and, what, and where we wanted to go. Uh, Dark Horse was a, an idea that we had back in 2009. We started doing a lot of research and uh, looking at a lot of stuff that we wanted to do as far as a family business goes. And we actually started, we started uh, doing a lot of uh, background work, started looking at a lot of different business ventures that we wanted to get into. We wanted to do something that actually we could all apply our, our, uh, our backgrounds to. Myself, I came from the food and beverage business, and I was there for 15 years. My brother Patrick actually was, a, uh, was in financial planning, but before that, he worked at a microbrewery for a number of years as well. My brother Eric came from, he was a lawyer, and if you don't know, a lot of stuff that goes into starting a distillery or start going into the liquor business has a lot to do with a lot of laws, legalities, a lot of stuff that you have to actually uh, have to actually have uh, approvals for, licensing, that type of thing. So he was able to help with that. So we actually started the process, started the ball rolling, and in 2010 is when we broke ground over at our distillery in Lenexa. When I talk about a small batch craft distillery, small batch craft distillery is, there's a lot of different nuances out there. There's a lot of different definitions. From when you see, when you go to the liquor store, you're gonna see a lot of 
terms thrown out there is what small batch is all about. Small batch could be on all sorts of different bottles. But what we do here at Dark Horse, what we do over at Dark Horse, is really, really small batch. We start off with about 1,000 pounds worth of grain. And from 1,000 pounds worth of grain, we go into a 500 gallon mash. The grain that we use comes all locally to us between Missouri and Kansas, particularly our corn and our wheat. Our rye, we do have a, we, we had been getting a lot of rye locally, but with a lot of the, with, with a lot of the farmers, they're starting to kind of shy away from what, growing rye, and kind of focus more of their efforts on corn and soybeans, so we've had a problem getting some rye here, so we go up to the north for that sometimes. So a thousand pounds worth of grain is what we start with. And here on the, you'll see the process as we kind of go along. So we go into the mashing. From the mashing, we let sit in fermentation. From fermentation, we'll take it to distillation, okay? The mashing is where we're actually cooking the grain. We're adding the water, we're adding the grain and letting it, and, and letting it boil. Once we've cooled it down enough, then that's when we move it to fermentation. Fermentation is where we start to make the alcohol, where that carbon dioxide starts to release, and that's where the alcohol is starting to be made. From the fermentation, we'll send it over to distillation. We have a 500-gallon copper still that we use, uh, and we actually pull the alcohol from there. We do, in turn, do the barreling and the bottling after that particular point. But from distillation, what we get is actually 10% of alcohol. 10% off of 500 gallons is not very much. So in all essence, that's pretty much of a small batch from what we do. We do also donate a lot of our spent grain from actually, a, a, after we've done a distillation, we will have some mash that sits into our, in our copper still. We donate that, donate that to local dairy farmers who come and pick up our spent grain or our spent mash twice a week. And what they do is they feed it to their dairy cows. And their dairy cows actually, uh, funny story, we, when we start, first started this process, everything was new to us, going through, the, going through doing mashing, milling, all that type of stuff. So, when our local farmers started coming and picking up the stuff, we didn't realize how relied upon they were of our spent mash feeding it out to their cows. So our local farmer had called one afternoon, and we were actually, there was no production being done for a few days. So we didn't have any spent grain to give to him. So he started freaking out. He was like, oh man, I need that, I need that mash. I need that mash to, to feed to my, to my cows. A lot of those cows, those cows will not eat regular, their regular feed because they basically were on that diet of all that spent mash and spent grain. So we ended up, uh, ended up getting production going, got the, got the stillage to him, and he was able to feed his cows. But in all essence, they're very happy cows, I would, we like to say. <laughs> when, they see that, when they see those totes pulling up with that spent grain, they come running because they're really they're trained to, to for the, on the spent mash. Damien, I hate to I hate to cut you off because I know there's a lot more to talk about, but I, I'm sure a lot of this will come out yes. in the questions. So let's go ahead and start with the questions, please. Okay, I'll run up Got front here. Over here. Raise your hand if you want us to find you. One of the things that seems to be your challenge is, is like for those first two you mentioned, you've got to let them age. Correct. So you can't just produce and sell. So how are you addressing the fact that you've got to wait? We have to, well, one of the things that we did was, um, well, the first two items that we did come out with were Ryder Vodka, Long Shot White Whiskey. Those two products did not have to age. So we got those out in the market uh, back in 2012. So we started selling those, but we also put in, put in our event space. We put in the event space and started booking events at our distillery. 
we needed to get some money rolling in. So we started booking that event space and we started, we started getting a lot of calls, wanting people, to, people wanting to come over, doing corporate events, doing weddings. We started do, booking weddings at the distillery. <laughs> we have people that are, actually we've had, we've done over 10 weddings, actually ceremonies at the distillery as well. So it was one of those things where that's where we kind of started bringing some income into the distillery. Like you said, you have to let that stuff age, and there's no rushing whiskey either. I mean, the one thing that's the hardest thing is to do is, is to project, particularly for an aged product. We actually have to, we, what we'll do is, we lay down as, we've laid down as much whiskey as we possibly can, just seeing the trends and seeing how, how, how the whiskey boom is hit but it's hard because you can't sit there and say, I'm gonna have X number of cases ready in six months because you don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know what's gonna happen in that barrel. A lot of it has to do with not only the climate, but it also has to do with what's, what's happening in that, bar in that, in that barrel, so. D Damien, before we go to the next question, I know you have a slide. Um, Damien's kind of shy about this, but they've, re they've received some really cool awards recently. Can you tell us yeah. the top? So we actually, um, recent awards that we've won, we've uh, just two weeks ago, we won a, uh, three gold medals for our long shot white whiskey, our dark horse distillery reserve bourbon whiskey, and our DHD special release Barrel Strength Reunion Rye. We got those from the American Craft Distillers Association, which is a new uh, organization set up for uh, craft distilleries like us, like our size. Currently, there's about, there's a, roughly about 450 craft distilleries across the country, like our size. So the trend of Craft distilleries is really starting to take off. Organizations like this were set up to help solidify, to help continue that craft distillery um, movement. And so that, that's where we got those gold medals from. We also won a 2014 silver medal just last week from the World Whiskey Awards, which is done all over the world. It's a, it's a competition for all the whiskeys around the world. So we won that with our Reunion Rye Whiskey. 2013 double gold from the 50 best rye whiskey judging. And that was a judging that was done in New York City out of 24 whiskeys. Rye whiskeys were judged and we scored the most number of points and got a double gold for it. Um, and then we also have our BTI uh, gold medal for our bourbon and our white whiskey and our BTI gold medal for our Ryder Vodka in 2012. Way to go. So, so, yeah. thank you. So, I mean, really what we're trying to do, what we are all about is really, I mean, we're trying to put out the best spirits we possibly can, you know, and one of the things that is is that we're trying to just spread the word of what we're doing here in this market. You know, we actually, we're in five states right now. We're in Kansas and Missouri, and we also have distribution in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. So Kansas and Missouri, between Kansas City, this is our home market. This is what we, 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 wanna, we wanna just continue to spread the message of what we do and, and how we're able to contribute to this local market. So, Go ahead. Great, we got a question over here. Thank you. I'm from the government. Okay. So what I would like to know is have you or you anticipate receiving any federal, state, or local financial incentives? Um, we have not. We, 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 exactly. I wish we, on the, on, on the Kansas side, we have looked into it, but um, it's been very, we, we haven't really gotten anywhere with that so far. Um, that would help out big time if we if we did, but it's we haven't haven't any, and nothing's progressed actually. So, 
Hey, Damien, we got yes. some excited folks back here. Lots yeah. of questions. Hi, I've got two questions. First sure. of all, um, do you guys uh, have a, a growth plan? I mean, what's, what's kind of the next step for Dark Horse? And uh, we have a coffee shop that's getting ready to open, and we have a liquor license. Oh, awesome. So how do I get <laughs> your product in there so we can um, slip a little uh, love into Yeah, totally. Slip a little product. love in the coffee. Yeah. We make some spiked coffees for sure. I, yeah, I like definitely. where that's going. Well, right now our growth plan is to, like I was saying earlier about the projected, um, our projection as far as whiskey goes, excuse me, we, we've got a, uh, we, we know we're going to be in a, uh, another state come this year, um, but really what we're trying to do right now is just kind of trying to keep up with the demand of our markets that we're in now. The whiskey it's a hard, hard thing to lay it down and say, okay, I'm going to get this num X number of cases out of it. The reason being is because you're going to have loss. We're actually losing alcohol when we're in a barrel. We're actually losing about 20% in the barrel. So it's hard to kind of figure, say, hey, our growth plan is that we want to sell X number of cases by the end of this year. We have that a little bit, but at the same time, you know, we have to continue to fulfill our current uh, commitments that we have with our, our guys that we're distributing to now, so. We have yes. a question here in the middle. Yes. So I love the 15 and 18 year uh, Glen Fittich. How do yes. you, uh, how does it compare in taste quality to say a nice bottle of Jameson or Glen Fittich? Exactly. Um, well, what we do is actually, I get these questions all the time about how long is your product aged for? How long has it been in the barrel? Uh, I like such and such, X number of years, that sort of thing. Well, our spirits are gonna be different from that. We don't have the aging time, of course, because we haven't been in existence that long. Um, but. Really, what we do is we take every single measure we possibly can to ensure that what we pull out of the barrel is going to be extremely flavorful. It's going to have all those notes that you get from a 15, 18 year age product. We focus in on the spirit that goes into the barrel, okay? We take pure ethanol from our distillation. When I say we're yielding about 10% off of that 500 gallon mash. That's actually 10% of pure ethanol because you're doing cuts. You're doing heads, hearts, and tails. Hearts is the pure ethanol, and that's what we deal with only, okay? So the spirit that's going into the barrel is extremely flavorful already. So you're putting that into the barrel, and also we, we barrel at a lower proof as well. So at a lower proof from the research we found, we're barreling at 110 proof. By law, you can barrel at 125 proof. That's the TTB law. That's the federal government allows you to at 125. But we're barreling at 110 to be, become more flavorful. And so we're, we know that we're being compared to a lot of those aged whiskeys that have four, five years, even, you know, as much as 15 years. And all we would say is that we hope that when you're trying our spirit, our whiskey, that it actually, you, you're, you're enjoying it for what it is and the care that we've taken to, to produce it, so. Damien, got another question in the back sure. here. Hi, Damien, good hey. to see you. How you doing? One of the things that I've heard a lot from other distillers uh, in the area, especially craft distillers in general, are the hurdles legally to get up and going. So from a business standpoint, because this would be the community to bring these challenges up to, yeah. what, do you, what would you say is probably the biggest hurdle that needs work to be able to allow these businesses to really get up and going? Well, particularly, we've had a, a, a struggle um, on the Kansas side, okay? And when we came in to start producing on the Kansas side, 
the only thing that we were able to do was get a production license. We ha had, had gotten a production license. And at that particular point in time, the hurdles were that we wanted to bring people into our distillery. We wanted to be able to do tours, and we wanted to be able to, people to be able to taste our products, our spirits. At that point in time, there was nothing like that going on. They, they had no law for that. So a year and a half later, we took it to the state of Topeka um, and applied and, and hired a lobbyist to come on with us to help us be able to get a, uh, what we wanted was a something called the micro distillery license, okay? Wineries have it in Kansas. Breweries have it in Kansas, but there was nothing for distilled spirits. So we applied for a license, um, and actually what we were, are able to do is at 100,000 gallons or less, we have this micro distillery license. This is gonna also able for us to be able to do tours and tastings at our distillery. The hurdles that you have, though, also are not only from the state that you're dealing with, but it also is within the, the, the TTB as well. In order for you to be able to get a license to be able to make distilled spirits, they want, your, they want to see you make the investment before you're able to get a license. We were able to, what we did was, we had to get order our 500 gallon copper still before we were able to get licensed through the TTB. On that copper still, they give you a number. It's a serial number. And from that serial number, what you're able to do is you have to spill that number in when you apply for your TTB license, your federal government license. So when they send that back to you and saying that you're approved, then you're able to start doing the production. But at the same time, you also have to make sure at the state level you're still good to go as well. So Damien, did that when the when you hired the um, lobbyist, did that change the happy hour laws in Kansas? It's, it it also with that particular law that was passed for the micro distillery license, the the other thing that was attached to that bill that was presented to the uh, that was presented there in Topeka was the happy hour license. Yeah, you can have happy hour in Kansas now. And that was what just passed a year and a half ago. And you can also not only have happy hour, but liquor stores in Kansas, retailers in Kansas can actually do samplings, liquor samplings in their store. So, yeah, so in, in Missouri's, I mean, Missouri's been doing this, but Kansas has been kind of behind in the times on that. So our license, our bill that we presented, all of a sudden got all of these, all of this stuff attached to it, okay? So at that particular point in time, it was a huge year for passing these laws, these liquor laws. The other law that did not get passed, that's still being fought through the state of Kansas, is grocery stores in Kansas wanting to sell liquor. Right now, they can't. But that's been a big, big uh, hot button topic for, liquor, for, retail, for uh, grocery stores to try to get that passed. We thought that was going to get added to our bill. And if that would have been added to our bill, or a rider been put onto our bill for that, our bill would have gotten denied. So we were lucky that it didn't get, didn't get on there because that bill has been sitting in, front of, uh, sitting in front of the state for, it's been going on, I mean, it's up close to eight years, nine years now, so. Hey, Damon, we really appreciate you presenting. We yes. would love to know two things, actually. Number one, where did your name come from? Okay. And number two, what can we do as a community to help you out today. Okay, the name of Dark Horse comes from that, that underdog, kind of that long shot, like as we named our long shot white whiskey. We knew we had a long, long road ahead of us when we started this business, and we still do. We still do. We're still always talking about the message 
about what we do and who we are. But when we were starting to do that research of seeing all just out what's out in the market, when we started looking at all the retailers and all the, the spirits that line the shelves of the retailers, and not only the retailers, but also on back bars, I mean, our spirit would be just one sitting on, whether it's a second or third shelf, sitting there, and amongst hundreds and hundreds of spirits. So we knew we had a long road ahead of us, and we knew we were the underdog. And that's kind of where Dark Horse kind of comes from. So um, what you could do to kind of really help us out is, well, first off, if you could pick up a bottle, that would be great. <laughs> but really, just to spread the word of what, who, uh, of, of, of what Dark Horse does and what we do, um, pick up a bottle. Tell your friends. Come out to the distillery. Come out to see our place. We do public tours. Uh, we do them about three to four times a month when we're kind of juggling that in between events that we have out there as well, like uh, private events and stuff. But come out to the distillery. See what we do. See how we make it, OK? Because I mean, we can give, I can talk to you about the process and everything, but until you actually see it firsthand, you don't know. But it's all about spreading that message, spreading the word. Go to our website, go to our Facebook, go to our Twitter, and just give us some likes and stay up on what we're doing. Even if you're not a spirits drinker, even if you're not uh, into whiskey or vodka, I mean, all it is, it's, it's, it's tell your friends, maybe they may be. Awesome. So, Give me a big round of applause. Thank you guys very much. I really appreciate it. And, and for those of you who are interested, I'll be uh, out of my car. We'll be giving shots of whiskey out by my car if you guys are all interested. So I can't do it in here, but I can do it in my car now. Just <laughs> Thanks. All right, and before we let you guys go today, um, my name is Nate Olson. I'm lucky enough to work with the One Million Cups program. I want to tell a quick little story about Mr. K. Um, when Ewan Kaufman was uh, young, in his youth, he got really sick. Um, the doctors told him that he had to stay in uh, bed for a year. And so every morning, his mom would wake up at the crack of dawn um, and go to the local library and get him a stack of books, and he would read all day. And so he learned at a really young age that books were um, not only going to be a big part of his life, but a big part of his business. And so the way that we live out that legacy here at the foundation is uh, we say that books are free here at the Kauffman Foundation, and we're cleaning out some of our library. So on your way out today, in the Troost Room, we have about 800 books. Um, some of them are around entrepreneurship. Some of them are... Um, Really, really interesting. Um, so anyway, grab a free book on your way out. So, all right, see you next week. Thanks.